So welcome everybody to Brain Club. Uh, tonight is, uh, um, we'll be discussing challenges and experiences of neurodivergent parents. Uh, first, uh, thank you to tonight's sponsor, University of Vermont Center on Disability and Community Inclusion. So um, uh, just uh, by way of introduction, as we always do, our community agreement. So all forms of participation are okay. You can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly don't uh, expect you to look at the camera or sit still or anything. So fidget, stim, eat, anything goes. And everyone is welcome, especially because a lot a lot of folks are um, uh, participate with their videos off. There may be little ears listening. So we just uh, will keep that in mind, uh, you know, as, 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 as we're um, going through the evening. Um, you can communicate in any format that you're comfortable with, either unmuting and using mouth words or typing in the chat box, whatever works for you. And just a word about safety and uh, including affirming all aspects of identity um, and respecting and protecting one another's access needs, especially as our group has gotten larger. Um, we want to give space for everyone to participate in their own way. And of course, observation is a completely valid form of participation. But for those who um, do, do um, you know, as an access need, need some, some space for processing time and space of entering the conversation. Um, and uh, you are welcome to, because uh, this uh, part of today's Brain Club will have a, a, a pre-recorded set of interviews with our panelists. Um, so for about 25 minutes, um, the video will will play, and you're welcome. Uh, we'll have the I'll be facilitating the chat while that's playing, and so um, you're you're welcome welcome to use the chat while the video is playing. And uh, last bit, uh, just today is for education purposes only. It's not medical advice. And for that reason, just note that individual traumatic experiences, and of course, you know, there's lots of traumatic experiences associated with becoming a parent, and individual traumatic experiences are best processed in a therapeutic setting outside of Brain Club. Closed captioning is enabled. You just need to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, either the live transcript closed captioning icon or the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles or hide subtitles. And uh, speaking of the chat, um, if you're new to Zoom um, or just by way of refresher, um, you're looking for the, uh, the chat box window, the speech bubble to access the chat. Okay, so. We're still in May, neurodivergent lived experiences. Um, so here we are, experiences of neurodivergent parents. Um, and here we go. You know, parenting is hard, whether you're neurodivergent or not. Parenting is hard for, you know, most people. Um, and for many neurodivergent parents, there are some specific additional challenges. Um, and often that we are not prepared for, um, that um, we're not expecting, no one's talked about this, maybe we don't even know that we're neurodivergent. Um, and a lot of people find themselves in chaos. That's a picture of me with my then one month old um, I think maybe that was like the one picture we took. Um, of, of, of that time of our lives because everyone else was just, everybody was screaming most of that time because it was just so hard in unexpected ways. This is a picture of me on the left one week before I became a parent. There I am, a doctor who takes care of babies. I thought I knew what I was doing. Yeah, Luna felt otherwise and made it clear in no uncertain terms that um, I didn't know what I was doing and she was going to let us know by screaming all of her waking hours to let us know that her little baby access needs were not being met. And the thing is, there's a lot of parents whose access needs are not being met too. Some of the specific challenges um, of parenting for neurodivergent people relate to sensory sensitivity. And this is an example of, and, and, and anything I'm going to go through, many people have no idea that these things are playing a role um, for them. 
They just know that they are in chaos. They are dysregulated. They don't, you know, just anyway, but these are some of the factors. So sensory sensitivity. Um, if, for example, you have the kind of brain that is really sensitive to loud noises, um, and all of a sudden you have a screaming baby, uh-huh. Um, or if you have some, you know, tactile aversions and now you're not having space and you, you know, just all of that, um, there are, you know, maybe someone has uh, established some routines, some protective routines um, that, that, that keep people regulated. And now all of a sudden you're not having access to those. Executive functioning. You know, if you uh, if, if it's hard at baseline to meet your own needs and get through the day and then layer on the additional executive functioning challenges of managing life for multiple people, not just yourself. And when we think about um, how hard it is for so many people to meet their access needs, um, then you layer on conflicting access needs. Um, you know, if there's a child who has the an access need to discharge um, energy by screaming, and a parent has an access need for complete silence in order to think, well, conflicting access needs. And then you layer on social interactions, challenges of emotional regulation, um, challenges of having access to your skills for emotional regulation, which are by and large cortex skills. If you're dysregulated, you may not have access to those things. Um, and so um, I am going to, um, I, th I, th I, th I think that's my last slide, David, if you want to start queuing up the video. Um, I just wanted to say, as David's queuing up the, the video. Uh, like, you have to unshare yeah, your yeah. screen first. Oh, sorry. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> All right. That's okay. okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, but I guess before I'll do that, I always forget that part. Sorry. Anyway, um, there's a lot of things that don't help. Um, you know, when we think about how ableist this society is, the messages that are, you know, that, 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 that send that there's one right way to be a person, there's one right way to be a parent, all the parenting books and all the things that people say that like, don't apply to a lot of a lot of people and that embedded in a lot of those messages are that it is superior to be able to do the thing. And not surprisingly, um, for, for growing up in an ableist society, many people internalize that narrative and the self-judgment and shame that come from those internalized messages. And then not only is it difficult to ask for help when one is struggling, um, and of course, you know, we can, uh, what we're going to talk about for Brain Club next month, all month, we're going to talk about barriers to healthcare. Um, so, so, and then what happens, even if you can access professional support, um, often the advice that is given around parenting doesn't apply to the situations that many people find themselves in. And so tonight we will be uh, joined by our panelists, Travis, Charlie, Kat, and Nadine, and we will hear, hear from their experiences. And um, again, we'll have the chat box going and then we'll have time for discussion to follow. When I was pregnant, I had this like, I had this brain rule of like, I'm going to become a calm person because I need this. It was anyway. So like I did yoga and I had yeah. counseling and I like uh -huh. walked and I was in nature and I like really yeah. was actually regulated and doing really well. Uh -huh. um, and then I became a parent and yeah. I had no idea about my sensory processing. I had no idea yeah. about my PDA. I had no idea yeah. that like, I, I had just no idea. And so right again, it's the uh -huh. narrative of like, there's something wrong with you that you mm. are so in chaos again, mm. when this is like all that you've ever wanted. What are some challenges that you face as a neurodivergent parent? I think the main challenge for me that I, and I've really come to understand this better in the past year or so is how much downtime and rest I need for my brain. And I can't get it. <laughs> Learned really quick when Jacob was first born that like, 
oh, wow, I've sort of hidden my whole life by taking care of other people's needs. So I didn't have to do the hard work of taking care of my needs, which is much more complicated. But Jacob, especially, you know, when he wasn't sleeping, he take that took so much energy, like you're like, oh, I need help. I, I do need help accessing or, you know, meeting my needs so I can even remotely meet his. And so that was a huge learning curve, not just for me, because I was like, oh, I've never really done this. Um, and then everyone around me was like, oh, he's suddenly becoming very demanding, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, just coming to understand that it's exhausting in here, like the level of information and processing and analyzing and everything is just a lot and exhausting and ideally I would have not just downtime and, and rest but solitude um to be able to just like decompress and process stuff and you know like reinvigorate myself but it's it's really hard to get that being a working parent, um, a homeschooling slash unschooling parent also. So that's the thing that I, when I look at my life, it's like, oh, I really could use a lot more rest. Well, what's it What's it like to be a neurodivergent person parenting? Like, mm. what, what's that been like? You, you can still talk me. about Elsa and Anna again and like, yes. and we can go from there. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just, I was just saying that, um, everyone knows else is autistic, but not everyone knows Anna has ADHD, but then Mel's saying, well, maybe not everyone knows else is autistic. I was like, wow. Autistic. Yeah. Mind blown. Yes. It's not autistic a thing. She's just a, yes. That's why she can't be queen too. Right. She doesn't want to deal with that kind of social posturing. Anna's perfect for it. It worked out. It, it 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 did work. It, it worked out in that you know Elsa achieved niche construction by going out to live in the woods. Um, what are some challenges that you have faced as a neurodivergent parent? I'm still struggling with the concept of production. You know, we talked about it during All Brains Belong. That whole concept of raising productive kids of being productive every minute of every day and being productive myself every minute of every day you know what does that really mean <laughs> announced to me the beginning of like the weeding out process that i think any neurodivergent parent needs to go through you know in terms of uh creating a safer bubble mm -hmm. um and so then it was years later when we when we first got a diagnosis about jacob and then months later, before I start, you know, oh, what really triggered it or triggered it for me is I had this, a picture of me as a little kid about Jacob's age, about four years old. And I just, it fell out of a box somewhere and I stuck it on the fridge and it sat there for a couple of months. And one day I noticed that in the picture, I'm scratching my arm like this. And Jacob does this exact same scratch to my exact to my arm <laughs> but it's exactly really? the same little movement and i and i asked my mom and dad i'm like did i do that as a kid and my my, my dad didn't know my mom's like well not that much you know she was mm -hmm. getting defensive already <laughs> and so that started the rabbit hole of like huh we might look pretty similar um mm -hmm. and then once we were getting a, a comfy blanket from costco and they have like two times of super soft blankets and for some reason one of them was really comfortable to me and the other one was really comfortable to him and so we're having this fight over how do we cuddle on the couch with the blanket is is kind of like our first access needs and i'm getting frustrated with him for not accepting my blanket and eventually it dawned on me that we were both just as like we were the same but it but it's very real like my soft blanket is prickly to him his words you know and his soft blanket i can say yeah it's soft but it doesn't make me feel good it's stim clash stim clash so like how does that play out for you because like i imagine that a lot your your access needs 
um, may conflict from time to time with other members of your household? Right. Well, and before I knew I was autistic, which was just a few years ago, I, I would just be struggling almost all the time. Like, because all, I'm actually a mix of sensory seeking and sensory avoidant, and it's really hard to parse out. Like, when it comes to sounds of, you know, screaming kids or kids jumping on me, I can get overwhelmed. But when it comes to, um, but, you know, like, this is the reason I'm wearing like three or four layers isn't just because I don't want to turn up the thermostat. This is like my self soothing, always a hat, always a, you know, and so, you know, I'm this mix of seeking and avoiding. And um, it's been really, you know, knowing that has been so important and little things like that just start adding up and then you start to realize that like oh you're not just raging a neurodivergent kid but you have a neurodivergent family mm -hmm. um and then you're you know and this is years suddenly access needs start to come in mm -hmm. and you know like oh i thought i had to just negotiate my own needs now i have to negotiate my own access needs too <laughs> um and that one is largely sound he's very loud and I'm not, and uh, or it, it's very triggering to me. And, and I've tried ear earplugs, um, but a lot of the ones you put in your ear, they make internal sounds louder. Like you can hear yourself chewing more and, and that kind of bugs me. And I actually, you know, I don't even have to do it that much anymore, but um, one of the most important things to me was just having these and um, they're big. And not only is that nice, cause I like the pressure, it's nice because the kids can see them. So if they see me putting them on, they're like, oh, he's overwhelmed, you know? Wow, that's powerful. Yeah, and it isn't, and they know I can still hear them with them on, yeah. so like I'm not ignoring them. Yeah. But it, you know, it just really is, you know, it's kind of like certain animals that can puff up parts of them when they're distressed. It's just like, whoop. <laughs> That is amazing. And you're, when you're modeling for them, you know, me as a human, I am meeting my own access needs. This is how right. I'm going to regulate. Right. And I'm still figuring out how to ask, ask for my needs, but sometimes it's easier with kids because they really start out with a blank slate, you know? Um, how do you, are you able, or are you able to meet your own access needs as a parent? We definitely have some conflicting <laughs> access needs. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, yes, I think in one area, I could think of an example with sleep. I need my sleep. And I mean, it's, it's sacred even for my kids. We have health issues that pop up if we're not sleeping. So that was a big one that we had to address. Um, talking about how can we find a way to meet our needs. So first, you have to figure out what they are, but then how can we together figure out a way to meet all of our needs? Otherwise, a lot of access needs are just like, like it's like micro dosing um, with access needs, you know, so like in my ideal world, I would have like a man cave with a super big stereo system so I could feel music. Mm. Like headphones don't don't do it. Um, like I used to run a nightclub. Like oh, you did feel like like wow. your your glass of water rattles off the table, you know? Wow! It's so loud. Wow! So so like if I get a chance to go to the grocery store by myself. I remind myself to listen to loud music in the car with a good stereo, you know. I love that. Um, awesome. So it's it's like, you know, stealing your access needs. <laughs> that to me, Elsa was was aware of her access needs. She's like, that's enough, Anna. And then Anna right, like, exactly. put on the gas. Like, like that's enough. And there was like third strike. It's like meltdown. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that is, you know, that is actually a good um segue to thinking about my my parenting because i have a seven-year-old and a three and a half year old and they have very different seven-year-old is much more um 
sensory seeking than the three and a half year old and you know that kind of stuff does like, he can't shoot fire or ice or anything but yeah almost <laughs> <laughs> not yet no i think there was a study or something that came out you know that the, the families that eat together around the dinner table without screens without t- you know anything to have a conversation you know those are the families that make it that stick together and what like, yeah maybe where is that study <laughs> I don't know, but I think maybe that's good for a lot of people, but that's right. good for us. It was so stressed out. It, it has definitely been just like such a continual process of unlearning, letting go, surrendering. Yeah. Um, this is not at all what I thought it would look like, be <laughs> like, and you know, and, and there was like quite a lot <laughs> to go through to <laughs> So I mean I think it's you know, it's it's like it's like unlearning, like, you know whatever you thought parenting was supposed to look like. Yes. Yes. Like we put, um, when I moved in here, put little tags, name tags on every shelf and stuff. Cause you know, I think I'm autistic, but I've got the kind of, I've got ADHD traits mixed in too. Like most of us do. And like, I never took off the labels. Now I don't really use them anymore. And maybe someday I'll take them off, but it helps the kids with reading too, to be able to see them. So they started labeling stuff. Now it says daddy on my on my door, you know, and like I think the Hulk seven year old got really excited that she could make the Hulk say Hulk on him. That's amazing. One of the biggest, most important things for me has been coming to see both my child's brain and my brain through um a strengths based lens, yeah. like you know, like really focusing on the amazing strengths and benefits of having a neurodivergent brain um, and utilizing those and building those and honoring those and um and celebrating those rather than than focusing on what's wrong so do you talk about access needs sensory needs etc like do you talk about that explicitly with your kids i try to i'm still learning how to do that yeah but yes you know i i do i talk about you know well if they want the lights on you know maybe we'll turn them on but usually they're fine with it you know and and sound like you know i'll just i I just try to find the right way to say you know if if it's okay to be loud because sometimes i'm loud too i can't really regulate my voice volume but it needs to be like more farther apart for me because it's hurting me because it actually hurts you know if you're screaming and not, I'm not talking like screaming in fear or pain or something. I'm just like kids just like to scream. You know? Right. Sure. Sure. Right. I mean, you're, you're really, you're teaching them about conflicting access needs. I think if all humans understood conflicting access needs, we would have oh a lot gosh, less yeah. chaos in the world. He is getting old enough where I can say stuff like, it, it's really hard on my brain when you yell. Um, and he starts, so we're just getting to the point where we can do stuff like that. Um, Yeah, I think the biggest thing that has helped around being able to meet not just my access needs, but the needs of my whole family is having just very open, transparent dialogue about, you know, I need a break or I can't do that right now. I need a little time like that, you know, for a lot. It's like the transitions or whatnot are frazzling for me. And so having a demand right after the transition of need for engagement or whatever like often I'm just like "Ah," you know and so being able to just say like my brain needs a little time like that was really overwhelming for my brain um it's been so helpful and then having that so we all can say you know talk about what's happening in our brains and and then we all get it and understand. So it's it's like having that common understanding and language that has been so helpful in advocating, at least for getting those needs met. Um, and I think that leads more to being interdependent too, because I've, I've been thinking about interdependence versus independence and interdependence feels better to me. Um, I don't know that too. I guess I've been challenged. I've been struggling with 
figuring out how far I can push the envelope of showing my neurodivergent traits openly mm -hmm. outside of our home. I think we've 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 grown a lot in the past few years in our home, but how much can we take that outside of the home? Um, my community hasn't always felt super safe. I was going to ask you, like, you know, I mean, it was, it's it's such a neuronormative question that I included in my email to you, of yeah. like, and and, and uh, of, of of like, what do you wish you knew? Everything. I wish I knew everything about yeah. my brain. I wish I knew that my experiences were real all along. When I said something hurt, or you know, this is something a lot of people say, but when something didn't feel good. And, you know, as my own childhood, you know, my parents did a great job with what they had, which wasn't really a lot in terms of understanding neurodivergence, but the school system just, just ground me to bits, you know? And so like, it wasn't, it wasn't supposed to be uncomfortable to me in the classroom, therefore it wasn't. And like, that gets translated down to parenting too. I shouldn't be uncomfortable with this. I'm supposed to like kids doing this and that I'm supposed to be okay with this and always they come first but you know I can't actually be the parent I want to be if I'm in on in burnout or on the edge of meltdowns and shutdowns and you know amen so. um gosh I think back when when my my first child was born I didn't take off from work I self-employed and I thought as someone who's self-employed that if I took off, my work would suffer, I would lose business, people wouldn't understand. And, <sighs> and then when I finally did take off, it's like people understood the world didn't end, you know, it wasn't noble to push through so hard and that makes me think about one of the things that I've been starting to talk about with my six-year-old is around interdependence versus independence and like normalizing right. interdependence yes. because like the the narrative of like you know ooh you know you did the thing by yourself like I just it's so overly glorified right. do you talk about that with your kids you know I haven't that's a good that's a really good point uh you're right it's also they need to have some independence, but they don't, we don't want to like instill this colonial over, um, over emphasis on everyone doing everything on their own, which is like not healthy. It's not healthy at all. And like, it's okay to, it, it, it's, 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 pref it's preferable to belong to community and right. rely on and be connected to people. Right. And the people who are pushing the independence narrative often rely on others a lot more than they realize you know mm -hmm. so i am having to navigate social situations that i've avoided for decades again as my kid makes friends with people like yeah. birthday parties i hate birthday parties i hate birthday parties uh, there's a video of me on my own fifth birthday hiding like you know, and then my parents said they had a big birthday party because they didn't know I wouldn't like it. And they never did it again. They felt bad. I was like, well, you didn't know. But like, that's what I want to do as an adult, too. And kid, you know, birthday parties are big. And then I'm like, yeah, it's one of those things oh, that like it brings me yeah. back to being in college or high school where I'm in a social group, but I'm drifting to the side because I don't know how to be a part of it because. But maybe this is an opportunity to reimagine again of like. Maybe there's no right way to be at a birthday party. Well, Maybe that's true. You just name the thing of like, yeah, if this is a birthday party, some people play side by side. Some people, yep. you know, or like, you know, can, 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 is there some, like, what would you, rather than think about it as like gravitating toward the sidelines, avoiding the main right. activity, like, could you have an activity that you actually enjoy? It's just not being in yep. the big crowd of the people. Well, sometimes I try to find a job, like, oh, in one yes. case, there was a fire in the shelter, old shelter fire thing. I just took care of that. Or nope. you, the people who were supposed to feel familiar never did. Mm -hmm. And then that's what that contrast is what made me feel inadequate. 
I'm like, there's mm-hmm. something wrong with me that I'm uncomfortable around you, even though like, really, it's because you're an unsafe bucket person. But yep. I didn't have language to describe that. Mm-hmm. I was just like, mm-hmm. oh, what's wrong with me? I can't get along with the people. I feel so uncomfortable. I don't know what to say. What if, like, no, there's younger, know, what older if... kids who are bored. I'll go hang out with them. Because there's yes. only a couple of them. It's like, what if, if I if, consciously like... think about it, it makes it easier. And then I don't get upset with myself for why did I do that? You know, right? Because I'm like I'm I'm such a loser who like can't do the birthday party thing. Yeah, because it's like that's the old narrative. That's like yeah, exactly of an unrecognized exactly. neurodivergent person. That's like what we tell ourselves all the time. I could actually well, go to, you know, like a cocktail party, and if mm-hmm. no one knew anyone, I was yep. fine. Yep. Everything else, not fine. So not <laughs> yep. fine. Too clicky. Um, too clicky, right? Yeah. Um, well, and it's interesting anyone, because I see um, that pattern playing out for Luna already as a kindergartner. Mm-hmm. When she sees hey, that the anybody... other kids are familiar and she doesn't mm-hmm. like, she doesn't feel like she is on the in group, right? And so, yeah. So, so she, yeah, that that idea, that whole scaffolding piece, the 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 gap she can't navigate. She can't navigate the gap, right? Yeah, yeah. But if there's like a, if there's like an adult who is facilitating oh, you know um, being a, like a central figure who's facilitating a game where everyone has a yep. role and the expectations are clear um and yep. it's it, like there's some structure to it like that's fine mm-hmm. she'll play those games yeah and then like my parent my my kid wants to go to this whatever birthday party and then i end up doing what i always do anyway because i'm autistic which is go like sit by a fire or sit outside or something like alone and then it's like well then it seems like i'm not part of the you know, or then I don't want that to rub off towards my kid. It's like, well, he doesn't seem to want to interact. Maybe his kid doesn't. You, you know what I mean? It's, it's like, all the brain rules. It's like all the things that yeah. people like make up that like aren't aren't real, but but are common. Like they're not real, but they are commonly like held yeah. myths. Well, and um, I, like, yeah, it's like going back to like you, you're you're in this life where you're like showing up as your authentic self in the world. But like in these other instances, you're having to put your mask back on. So, well, and this is uh, your your experience as a parent. How does how does your lived experience when you see your child um, faced with that gap that 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 they can't navigate? What what are your what wisdom um, do you bring to those moments um, for yourself or for them? In the thick of it, I don't mm-hmm. I don't have this. It's like two minutes maybe it's like 60 seconds later before i can zoom out and then it's 60 seconds too late it's the matching of my experience as a child Mm -hmm. that makes me want to fix it and change Mm -hmm. it you know and certainly i i don't mean sweeping the challenges under the rug at all because i think there's also been a lot of real um power in sharing with my child around our different challenges and our shared challenges and i think that that's been so important um but i can see with my child like how much the the more that we just like do up the strengths and honor those strengths and make space for the strengths the better that they do um and so i'm working on applying that to myself too Especially for us that came from generations where you just, you really weren't allowed to be yourself, no matter who you were, like nobody was. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know how else we were discover ourselves after like wearing a mask for that long, but having a neurodivergent kid certainly makes it possible because you can, you can see who you might've, you maybe once were. And then you're like, oh, I, I could do that. I, I could be that again. So there we have it. So it's been a, a, a lot of, of great conversation going on in the chat. Um, and I, 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 I will open it up and ask what's standing out for folks. J.E., did you, uh, you, you, you had asked if you could make a comment. You want to go first? Oh, yeah. Um, I guess I'm, I'm ironically, um, I'm like 
almost two months into recovery and like the only relationships that get worse whenever I get sober are the ones with my family. Um, and it's like, I, I get in this predicament where it's like my parents have this whole thing where it's like, if they support me, there's like, you know, I say, Hey, can you hire me a life coach? And it's like, they end up hiring, like when I was younger, they would hire 10 people when they needed to hire two. It was like, or, and if that didn't work, they'd like cut all the support. Um, I mean, the predicament I'm dealing with, with my family is like, is it's like my parents have this idea that until like, I get my shit more together. They don't want to support me, but it's like, I, if I don't have transportation, if I can't pay for my own food, if I have to borrow money just to like survive, then I'm not in a good predicament. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's like, really? it's almost, it's almost like in my parents' case, it's like, if I do something stupid, anything that happens to me after happened because I did that dumb thing, not because other people did crazy shit to me. Yeah. And I think that a lot of, of, of people are in um, similar situations, right? Because there's a lot of these assumptions that people make and the rigidity when people are dysregulated, they like dig into that rigidity about how they think the world works. And that's not how the world works. Um, I, I, I wonder, um, you know, I, I, I think for a lot of people who learn that they are neurodivergent, um, later in life, often there's the, um, the wonderings about the, um, maybe some, maybe, maybe some things about one's parents, um, that maybe, um, there isn't, isn't a lot of awareness or insight into, um, on, on behalf of those parents of adult children. Um, I wonder if anyone has has experience like that in interacting with parents um, and, 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 and trying to represent their access needs, which is I think what, what the, the theme of, of what you what you mentioned. Michelle wrote in the chat, my family expects me to be the masked self because my unmasked self reminds them of their own, that they're trying to ignore. Yes, Michelle, I think that that is really common, um, and that, that's that's the point I was trying to make in, uh, in 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 the last bit I said about in 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 my interview. There is that, like, even a, as a parent, I I out of fear, I want that thing that reminds me of my struggle. I want that to not happen. And I think that that's 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 really common. Um, what have others' experiences been in navigating their interactions with with their own parents or families of origin? My my mom did really good until about my second semester in college after I got to about age twenty, and it's like she did a great job when I was a kid and a teen and then as soon as I became an adult it like all fell apart yeah yeah I'm so sorry and that's so so common it's not even I'm not even blaming her it wasn't that she wasn't trying to be helpful it was just it's like yeah I don't know how to it's just it's almost like yeah she didn't really like it's like she wants me to grow up, but she still like thinks of me as a 10 year old or two year old kid. Yeah. Yeah, I think such a common thing that I see both in my family and other people's is the um, the the brain rules and biases that come from people being neurodivergent and being undiagnosed um, and then what that turns into with their kids. Um, and so neurodivergent parents who've been masking their whole life um, and not realizing that they're masking. And then um, that turns into, oh, this is just how everybody is. Everybody just masks 24 um, seven. And what that looks like. I had to restrain myself from laughing. So 
so accurate. Reading in the chat, Elizabeth says, I think my parents and grandparents enforcing neurotypical norms created trauma for me and themselves. They seem more able to see a different paradigm for my kid and my role in parenting him, but he has more stereotypical autistic traits. I had a very high demand household growing up and it's tough letting that go. And uh, as I go low demand in my household now, Kelly says, I was shocked to learn that everyone doesn't mask. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, masking just as a, as, a, as a broader topic, and we talk about this often here, is that, you know, there's the, there, there are many people who it's not safe to unmask. They're not in environments where it's safe for them to show up as their authentic selves. And, um, and, and, and as people plunge deeper and deeper to burnout, even though masking for many people is a subconscious um, uh, experience, there is some degree of executive functioning and impulse control associated with, with masking. And often when people lose the ability to mask, that's when they maybe for the first time uh, learn that they're neurodivergent. Christina says, I think that there's a lot of fear attached to the parenting from, from control. It comes from trying to prevent bad futures for our kids, but it's the control that actually creates the chaos. Yes, um, I absolutely agree. And I think that especially when nervous systems are porous to energy, when you can detect the vibe that someone is trying to control you, or change who you are or how you are, that can be so profoundly dysregulating and it becomes uh, a vicious cycle. Elizabeth says, my family of origin is very wrapped up in traditional neurotypical conformity and anything else is threatening. If I am myself with them, they have to face their own failure and they can't handle that. And I think that um, as someone um, you know, comes to learn about their own brain and their own access needs, I think they're, you know, inevitably they're, they're, there are relationships that are no longer safe and that sometimes relationships where people get to a place where having relationships where they can, can be unmasked in certain settings and have to try to put the mask back on, it's, a, it's really hard to put the mask back on. And sometimes relationships like that, um, they, fall, they fall away. And that's hard and sometimes necessary. David says, we used to think we all needed to eat at the dinner table because our parents did and everyone tells us, yet for our kids, it's not always the best for them, right? Kelly, I, I've been like, like trying to think of what I wanted to say and, and how I want to say it. And I want to remember to talk about the dinner table, but I wanted to start with first, I, I grew up to, with a single mom who was wildly abusive. I did not have a good childhood. I don't have more than a handful of positive memories about the woman who gave birth to me. Um, and I left home at 16. Um, she somehow married a, an amazing person who is still in my life and is my chosen father. They are divorced, have been divorced for a long time. Um, and they didn't get married until I was like 18 or so, but I, I didn't walk into parenting having a single idea of what it should look like. I just knew what it didn't look like. I knew what I would never expose my children to in any way. Um, and we never ate together, my mother and I, never. And so it was very important to me that my family eat together at the table and 
we do. We eat together at the table, except for Wednesdays and weekends. That's when we movie it up or whatever. But the expectation of how you're at the table, that's like up for interpretation. You can be walking around the table. You can be standing at the table. You don't have to eat dinner if you're not hungry. I just ask that your presence is there because that's my access need to connect because I grew up watching Nick at Night and all of the reruns of all of the awful 1950s families, but they all ate dinner together. And it was just something that I romanticized and idolized as a kid because I was just so hungry for that sort of family that and I hear everybody and see everybody you know, saying how hard it is to sit at the dinner table. And then I start thinking like, oh my God, have I like enforced this awful thing on my family? And so, you know, I'm going to ask them after like, hey, is this like truly the worst thing ever for anybody? And, you know, to see how, how they feel about it, because I do recognize like this was my thing and it's wild parenting. And I was I'm grateful that my son was diagnosed super early. I wish that I hadn't gone 46 years without a diagnosis. That would have been pretty sweet. Um, but I'm happy where I am and I'm happy that I don't think I'm just this broken person that like there's reasons now that I understand. And um, so yeah, that's that's my little blurb about the dinner table. Thanks, Kelly. And I, I, I think it, it sounds, you know, that's it, it. It sounds like in so many other examples that you've created a culture where you can probe for people's access needs and unmet access needs. Kim says in the chat, "I have undiagnosed uh, neurodivergent family members who are very critical of people with quote poor social skills or who are quote socially awkward. I get that it's a survival mechanism because they see how badly unmasked people are treated and they see those traits in themselves, but it's still awful to hear." Absolutely. Christina says, every time I release expectations of how things are, quote, supposed to be, I see my kids way clearer. They thrive and excel in areas that they want to excel in because they don't have to put energy into trying to fit something that I am enforcing. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, and I, 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 I think, hold on, I'm just uh, scrolling down. Um, Anne Marie says, uh, has anyone ever read the book, uh, The Sharp End of Life? It's about uh, Deidre, uh, Alex Hollander's mom, uh, who's a famous rock climber and neurodivergent person, it's excellent. She realized his gift when he was young, and she always wondered why so many people wanted to control her children. Yeah. Um, and I'm just uh, scroll, scroll, scrolling, and uh, J.E., there's a, a comment just uh, recognizing you for for your vulner for making yourself vulnerable and sharing so much of yourself, and we really, really appreciate that. Um, and and I, I think I think there's so many, so many commonalities and so many hard things. Michelle says the shift from my house, my rules parenting to this is our home with safe boundaries is hard, but necessary. Um, and uh, Christina, uh, sorry, it's jumping, jumping all around it's the point of the night where it's hard to read. Um, removing the supposed to expectation from my kids has made it so much easier to remove those same expectations from myself. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's all a process, right? So it's a process of just like becoming more familiar with your own experience and your own needs and maybe having the opportunity to like look back and rewrite some of, some of the past narratives, especially like when those narratives came from other people to have context of like, yeah, if I got this message as a child, it maybe relates to a bigger picture here of like shame and stigma. And I think, you know, in addition to rewriting, writing those narratives, um, like Kat says, we can rewrite things with our kids. Sometimes when I give feedback to my child about like, well, you can't do it that way. You got to do it this way. Then I'm like, whoa, when I was little, my parents used to tell me X. Can you believe those brain rules? And then the six-year-old is like, ah, brain rules. Anyway, so it's 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 some um, it's it's some um, that kind of transparencies can sometimes be really help be helpful. And I think as it comes to like social situations, 
Um, and like, um, uh, I, I remember uh, as a, as a little kid, like a third grader, I remember this day my mom sat me down and was like, it's really important for people to like you. Um, and I think that's, that's probably pretty common that message and really probably what that relates to is the societal pressures that, you know, lots of people face, um, as opposed to that, the, there are other priorities, Sierra. Yeah, I just, um, I, I feel like I've said this before on brain clubs, but, um, I think especially when we're talking a lot about, um, these kind of like generational traumas, um, for lack of a better word, I really like to also think about the, um, aspect of generational healing. And even if it's that kind of slow progress, I mean, the fact that, um, my grandparents never talked about mental health. My parents thought about it in their forties and I'm thinking about it in my twenties and my kids are going to think about it when they're younger. Like there's, it, it takes a while, but those, those little steps are, are huge. Um, and, and like you said, Mel, having those conversations about this is, this is what my parents told me, or I acted like this and this is why I acted like this. And I would actually rather act a different, like being, having that transparency and making sure your kids know that it's okay to mess up sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's inevitable. And Marie says, I hope we're undoing generations of trauma. It's so hard sometimes, but worth it. And frankly, now that I changed my parenting philosophy, it's a lot easier to try to understand the nervous systems in my family than it ever was to try to control them. Um, and yeah. Um, so, so, um, uh, Christina says there's, um, so many, so many challenges from advocating for my kids and, um, and, and, uh, it's, it's, it's coming down to safety and JE is bringing up, um, areas of intersectionality when there's, you know, multiple aspects of identity that are marginalized and othered, um, and, and, and how much, how, 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 how important it is to, to, to find, to find community. And I think that um, uh, you know next week when we um, when we when we have our our monthly book chat. Um, so this is and this is the first time we've done a book chat by a non-speaking author. Um, and so when we think about you know inclusive community where everyone feels that they belong, this is a book written by a child that we're going to be discussing next week. Um, and uh, written by a by a 13 year old um, who is a non speaking communicator and wrote the whole book um, with a with a letter board and sharing some really powerful messages that I think um, are 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 um, have a real commonality to a lot of the painful things that have been talked about tonight. And I think that um, you know, just just um, it's 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 humbling um, where uh, it's it's it at least was humbling for me to have to to arrive at at, at such insights um, through the lens of a child. And um, with that, I uh, thank you all so very much for coming, and I will look forward to seeing you next week. Bye, everybody. Thanks.